It's four o'clock on Tuesday, and you know what that means. It's time for another one of Taxi's Quarantini Happy Hours. Woohoo! And thank you, fake band. Thank you, fake audience. Let's see if there's anybody in the chat room yet. There's nobody in there yet. Where is everybody? <laughs> hey, Dan Weber, how are you? Always first and foremost, aren't you? So uh, I'm going to tell everybody today. Hang on. I've got to look at my notes. I'm going to give you guys a simple way to get signed faster, get more placements, and make more money. Yep. A simple way to get signed faster, get more placements, and make more money. But before I tell you guys about that, hello, Darren Fletcher. Um, I want to talk about gophers for a minute. <laughs> as long as we're waiting for other folks to show up, I guess they got the alert and uh, they'll be coming along shortly. Um, gophers. Have, have either of you guys ever had gophers in your yard? Uh, I, I really truly feel like Bill Murray and Caddyshack. Um, gophers have overtaken the backyard at our house to the point where it's not funny anymore. Um, they've declared war on my yard and I'm declaring war on them. Uh, it, it's like there's an entire city of gopher trails and gopher holes all over the backyard. Ooh, you've had groundhogs. Those are even bigger. Yeah, the gophers are, are actually, these are pocket gophers. Um, they don't call them that because they fit in your pocket, although I think they would. Um, these gophers are probably about a half a pound each, the size of a medium-sized rat with a cute little gopher face. Um, but they have big pockets in their cheeks where they store their food, so that's why they call them pocket gophers. Man, oh man, I've tried the smoke bombs, I've tried sticking a hose in the ground, I've tried uh, gopher side or rodent, rodenticide, whatever they call that stuff. Uh, this has been going on now for the better part of a year. Hey, John Pearson, how are you? Um, and Edmund Red. Uh, yeah, the gophers have been terrorizing us now for better part of a year, but they seem to come and go uh, in waves. And right now, I guess because it's springtime, they're extremely active. You know, when we bought this house 18 years ago, we wondered why the backyard is lumpy. I mean, there is no flat part of the yard. It's like I, I've said to my wife, why wouldn't they have rolled, you know, one of those big heavy rolling things and flattened out the yard back in the day when they put the sod down? And now, in retrospect, I'm guessing that they did. But the gophers have dug so many holes. There are places in our yard where if you jumped up and down, you would just drop into a hole and be like at least up to your ankles, if not like halfway up your shin um, with your body in the gopher hole or your legs in the gopher hole. So, uh, yeah, I've been fighting with the gophers. I recently got a, a device called a gopher hawk. Uh, it looks like, basically it looks like... Uh, how did, like half a pogo stick and it's spring loaded and you take a prod and you stick it in the ground and you go bink bink vroop, and when you you know feel that it goes down with nothing pushing back uh hey sherry uh that's when you know that you've found either a gopher hole or a, a like a, a trail uh, underground trail and you take this device and you take the, the other half of it, which is kind of like a short pogo stick with a pointy thing on the end, and you widen out the hole, and then you insert this little spring-loaded trap in there, and eventually a gopher comes trotting along the trail to get from one place to another, and boom, it's lights out for the gopher. And I know, you know, we all love animals. Gophers are cute. They are. They have cute little faces, but they're rodents. They're basically rats with cute faces. And uh, let's just say that the gopher hawk dispatches them instantly. Um, they never know it hit them, no pain. Um, so yeah, I'll, I'm at war with the gophers and right now the gophers are winning. <laughs> All right, uh, hey Anthony, how are you? Welcome back. So uh, 
I want to tell you guys, and Martin, hello. Uh, I want to tell you guys about a simple way to get signed faster, get more placements, and make more money. And this is about instrumental cues primarily. Um, so we have known for quite some time now that many of the uh, production music libraries that we connect our members with, uh, if they hear something that they really like from a particular member or a bunch of members, that they reach out to the members and say, wow, this is great. Yeah, I want to sign this. Uh, what else do you have? And they frequently ask the composers to create a collection, an album, you know, of like maybe 10, 11, 12 tracks of similar stuff in the same genre. Um, recently, they've started to ask us to run listings where we're asking our members on their behalf to submit five to 10 things at one time. Um, and we're, we're starting to see some action with that. So, so here's my theory is that if you start creating albums of the same genre, you make it easier for them to work with you. Why is it easier for them to work with you? Because rather than them signing 10 or 20 or 30 cues in a particular genre with a bunch of different composers, each composer's got questions about the contract, um, each of the composers has to be filled in on how the library likes to get their material delivered to them, um, any technical specs that they need, things like that. Um, any tags that they would need you to provide. There are always little details that go into the relationship. Well, if a library finds one composer that's got 10 cues, then they only have to do the, explain that one time. They only have to talk about the contract with one person. So it's just easier for them. I personally think that there's a downside to that for the libraries. And here's what the downside is, in my personal opinion. That is, I spend an inordinate amount of time looking at production music library websites and going in and listening to their tracks. I tune my ears that way. I want to stay on top of where the quality bar is for each of those libraries. And it does vary quite a bit. Some libraries will tell us, oh, the, you know, it's got to be just A++, got to be super duper good. And I go listen to the stuff um, on their website and go, our members are better than that. <laughs> they must be thrilled with the stuff they're getting from us, uh, which we hear about. So uh, John Pearson saying, yep, what Michael's saying just came true for me. 20Q collection requested and they're all done. Good going, John. Um, so... Oh, I forgot where I was going with. Oh, so as I'm listening to various libraries to see where their quality bar is and see what kind of stuff they have in their catalog and see if there's anything that they may be light on or any genres that are kind of stale and maybe I should, you know, reach out to the library owner and say, hey, you know what? Sounds like you could use some new orchestral stuff. The orchestral that you've got sounds like it's 10 years old. Um, as I'm doing this, I'm realizing that in many of the genres, they've only got one or two or maybe three composers. There's not a lot of variation. But hey, who am I to tell them how to run their business? Um, I would think that if they had wider variation by more composers, that their library has more appeal. If I were an editor working on a reality show and I went to library XYZ and I searched for dramedy cues, and many of the dramedy cues were done by the same handful of composers. Uh, and you hear composer A, and, oh, look at that, there's 15 cues by composer A. You listen to the first one, uh-huh, that's good, but it's not what I need. And you listen to the second one, uh-huh, uh, not what I need. Uh, listen to the third one. And you start to realize that they all kind of sound the same. And I'm not talking so much like sound quality, but composers do have kind of a style of their own. So if they're doing 10 or 15 or 20 dramedy cues, the range of stuff is not gonna be that different. 
And so if I'm the editor and I'm looking for stuff, I'm going to skip, after hearing three that are kind of similar, I'm going to skip to the next composer and then go through the same process, maybe even on to the third composer. Um, so that's the downside as I see it. That's just my personal opinion. Uh, apparently libraries don't agree with me because many of them do this and they're clearly successful at doing it. So don't listen to me. <laughs> Just give me a platform to express my opinion. Anyway, so here's how you can get signed faster. Uh, an easier way to get signed faster. And once you've got collections or albums of cues, um, you no longer have just one or two cues in that library. Now you've got 10 or 15 or 20 cues in that library. Um, maybe they start asking you to do albums of different genres. Before you know it, you could become a composer that's got 15 different genres represented with 10 to 20 tracks in each of those genres. So now you've got, you know, whatever that math works out to be, a couple hundred tracks in that library and now repeat the same process in other libraries, before you know it, you've got a lot of tracks in a lot of libraries and you've dramatically increased your chances of getting your material used. So that's the methodology um, for doing that. Let me get my notes over here. Um, explain that. Okay, I talked about the downside. So here's how to make it easier. This is the easier part. Let's, let's stick with dramedy just as our example. So if you do the first dramedy cue and it comes out well and you're happy with it, uh, comes out well or comes out good? Well, um, it comes out nicely. <laughs> and you go, okay, uh, so now you've got a template. Uh, you've got a template in, in your workstation and you can use the same pizzicato string sound, the same uh, vibe sound, the same whatever sounds. You've got all your sounds picked out. So now all you have to do is create other cues using mostly, not entirely all the time, but mostly the, those same instrument settings, um, the same instrument choices and settings uh, for the basis uh, of each of your other cues. Obviously, to avoid what I mentioned earlier about everything kind of sounding the same, it'd be a good idea to throw other stuff in there just to um, keep it fresh and keep it a little different. But you've got a template. So now you think, okay, well, the first dramedy cue was mischievous sounding. Um, let's make a second one that is slapstick. Let's make a third one that is hip-hop dramedy. Uh, with a hip-hop beat. Let's make another one that is kind of dour or sad dramedy. Um, another one that's quizzical. So come up with all these different moods um, and obviously you're going to change your, your chord progression, you're going to change your melodies, you're going to change your beats, but the sounds are all there. So now you can give them a wide range of dramedy cues in a nice nifty little package called an album. And chances are they're not going to say, wow, this is great just as it is. They're probably going to get back to you with some notes and say, well, you know, I, I really like it. But on, uh, you know, track number three, you could do this to make it a little to make it work a little better for me. Oh, OK. Um, and track number seven, um, it doesn't have an intro, but I feel like it should have a drum turnaround or something just to bang it in at the beginning. Um, track number nine needs to build more. It's, it doesn't have enough of a developmental arc. So they'll give you some notes, but basically they will take the collection pretty much as it is, and then you just fix the things that they give you notes on. Everybody's happy, boom. Now you've got an entire album in that genre in that library. Uh, so there are a couple ways to go after that. Uh, pat yourself on the back for doing a good job. Now you could approach another library and repeat the same process for them. Uh, and you could approach yet another library and do the same process for them. So now you've got albums of dramedy cues in two, three, four, five libraries. I don't know that I would recommend doing it in many libraries because... Um, 
you may wear out your welcome a little bit, uh, you know, but after you've taken those dramedy cues and, and made them um, new ones for several different libraries, then move on to another genre and repeat the process. So there you go, folks. That's how I believe that you can get more cues signed, uh, make it easier for yourself and get more money coming in because you've got more cues out in the field working for you. So there you go. Uh, let's see, do I have a sound effect for that? There you go. Okay, Peter Ray Hill has a question. Um, when submitting two versions of the same song title, what's, what's the need and where to rename each file? Um, I guess you're talking about doing non-exclusives. Um, most of the libraries will retitle them for you. Oftentimes nowadays they will put, uh, let's say the library is, you know, Bob's Music. Uh, so they might <coughs> put the initials BM in front of your title. I guess it was a really poor choice on my part. Um, so... Yeah, you can rename the stuff. Oftentimes, they're going to rename it anyway. Um, library owners are generally pretty good at coming up with names, titles um, that will make the cues stand out more, make them more appealing to their customers. So I don't think you've got to worry all that much about it. Um, as to the, what's the need? Well, the, the need... two version, When submitting two versions of the same song title... I don't really understand the question all that well, Peter. Um, do you want to rephrase it? Um, our libraries, and while you're retyping that, uh, Anthony Franz asks, are libraries generally exclusive? Um, they go both ways. Uh, I would say that starting about five, six, seven years ago, a ton of new um, non-exclusive libraries uh, started by a, a lot of composers that were having some getting some traction started their own libraries and they made them non-exclusive because they didn't want the deals to be onerous to the people that they were trying to sign. Um, and look, it's great to be able to take the same music and put it in you know, five different catalogs and have them retitle it. Now you've got five people out there pitching it. Are there collisions where the same track with three different titles might be submitted um, to the same request you know, three times and they go, whoa, I'm not touching that because it's the same piece of music from three catalogs. Yeah. Other people just go, hey, this was the first one to make it over the transom. There's also the pricing issue. What if library A, has, you know, charges X and library B charge, well, let's say library A charges a dollar. Library B charges two dollars and library three charges three dollars. Those are not real numbers, by the way. Don't anybody freak out just for illustrative purposes. So even though, um, oh, I should reverse that. Library one is $3, library two is two bucks, library three is $1. So they're gonna go with the cheapest of the three and therefore they may not take the first person's music that crossed their transom. So that can be problematic. More and more companies are now either trying to convert their non-exclusive catalogs to exclusive by reaching out to the composer and saying, hey, we're going to go exclusive. Would you like to uh, sign our new contract and make this stuff exclusive? Or you can walk away and put it elsewhere. Um, I think that there, well, I don't think I know that there are some entities, some networks, some production companies that will only work with exclusive just because they feel that it's... Um, less risky. Uh, I, I can't say that I've heard any stories and I, you know, I'm pretty well versed and connected with what goes on in the industry. Haven't heard a lot. I've heard, you know, a few little collisions where something's problematic, but nothing that's resulted in, you know, like, oh my God, I'm never working with that company again, or I'm never working with that composer again, or, uh, you know, we'll see you in court, buddy. Haven't heard a lot of that. Um, so there you go. Uh, Greg Carosa says, while I was originally nervous about exclusive deals, I almost exclusively do exclusive deals. 
I think the library works harder to get your work placed and many shows will only use exclusive music now. Um, yes and no, it, it all depends. You know, uh, you know if, it, if it's NBC, yeah, they want everything to be exclusive. Um, are there smaller productions, the, you know, or reality shows that we use stuff that's not exclusive? Yeah, all the time. So it's still a little bit of this, a little bit of that. I don't think either decision is a bad idea. I know a lot of our busiest, uh, highest earning taxi members have music in both types of libraries. Um, I know one company that started out doing instrumental cues non-exclusive, and now they're asking people to sign an exclusive deal. And the logic behind it is, hey, you can always go create more of that same type of track. So, okay, we've got it exclusively, but it's not like we tie your hands from creating more dramedy cues that you can put in other catalogs. Um, that same company, by the way, uh, is signing non-exclusive deals for songs. And here's why. There are plenty of, of libraries out there now, um, some of which are really, really good, and I would do this deal that I'm about to describe to you, is they want a song from you, and they want it on an exclusive basis, um, and they give you no money up front. It used to be pretty standard years ago that you would get 100, 200, 500, sometimes even 1,000 bucks for a single song or a track. Um, up front from a library, they would do a buyout. Um, they would get the publisher sharing and the master and give you money for that and you would keep the writer share, of course. Um, it, it's not uncommon to see that deal. As a matter of fact, it, it's pretty darn common these days. Um, I just got an email forwarded to me from our member services people the other day where a lady was kind of freaked out. She said, you know, I know better than to ever sign an exclusive deal and give up 100% of my publishing. Well, and, and I talked to my music attorney about it. Well, truth be told, the vast majority of music attorneys really have little to no idea about what the norms are in the music library world. They just don't know. They're used to doing licensing deals, you know, at a major record label level and a major publisher level where, you know, it's somebody's, somebody, it's a famous song or at least a song from a famous artist. Um, and that's a, a different kettle of fish. Um, let's, let's face it, cues are somewhat disposable. They're a bit of a commodity. Um, people aren't as precious about an instrumental cue. Uh, because they can go make more of them. So, but a song, um, a song requires, gosh, you got to write lyrics, you got to sing vocals, you may have background vocals, you may have to hire a singer. Uh, it, it's a much longer, more complicated process. Uh, it just requires more hours, more work, and you can't make as many of them. Um, they're not as templatable. <laughs> there, I just invented a word, as cues are. So, uh, I would be a little hesitant to sign an exclusive deal uh, on a song, but then again, there are libraries that I know that get a lot of songs placed in really good shows, a lot of you know broadcast network stuff, which pays more uh, through your per performing rights organization on the back end than say you know a, a reality show would on cable or a streaming thing would on Netflix, wherever. So. Would I sign a song that I wrote, if I wrote songs, uh, in a catalog that gave me nothing up front and took 100% of the publisher's share? Yeah, I would do that deal. If it's a good, solid company with a great track record. And obviously, we're not going to put a schlock company under your nose if you're a taxi member. Honestly, we've I saw some internal memo or something. that Oh, I was looking at the back end of our database late last night. And there's like 4,600 companies that Taxi has run listings for over the years. Out of all those companies that we've worked with, I think only three times have we ever given a company the boot. Uh, and at least two of those cases that I can remember, it's their deal was one thing and then they changed it and they didn't tell us. So we used the last listing that they gave us six months prior as a template to crank out the new one. And we erroneously sent out a, a listing that said it was a non-exclusive deal when they had in fact switched to exclusive and we looked really dumb. 
I, I wish they would have said to us, oh, by the way, um, now that you're running another listing for us, we should let you know we're no longer non-exclusive, we're exclusive. So we've given a couple of uh, companies the boot. I see uh, there's some chit chat in the chat room about uh, a term limit reversion in the contract. Um, that's a good idea. Reversion means that if they don't get your song or your track placed in a prescribed amount of time, typically three years is kind of a standard summer, five years. I've seen them as short as one year. I feel like giving somebody just a year may not be enough time. But whatever the term is, if they um, don't get your material placed, then on the anniversary, let's say three years, when the three-year term is up, you can let them know. Typically, it's like 30 days advance warning, maybe 60 or 90 days. You tell them that you'd like to not auto-renew that, and you're out of that contract. Now, other companies tell me that they don't want to do a deal like that, and it's not that they're so onerous or heavy-handed. It's more a matter of they don't want to have to reach out to all the entities where if they've given their music out on drives to people, um, which is still commonly done, they don't want to have to notify everybody, hey, this song is no longer under contract with us um, and take it out of, your, out of the catalog because nobody's going to do that. Um, other reversions will say you are now free to take this song or this track back. However, for any places that we have already distributed it to, if they end up using it, we still participate um, under the terms of our original deal. So we no longer have you under an exclusive contract with this piece of music going forward. However, if it's something that we signed, you know, three years ago and lo and behold, it gets used in a TV show after you've walked away with the song and put it somewhere else, then uh, that the first library, Library A, is going to participate under the terms of that original deal. To me, that sounds a little dangerous and a little squirrely because, well, now you may have signed it with a second library and the second library uh, could also be submitting it for that same opportunity. <laughs> and uh, it could be kind of like one of those non-exclusive library collisions, as I call them. Um, it could cause a little battle between Library A and Library B. Hey, you know, uh, we've got this track under an exclusive deal. Yeah, but we had it under an exclusive. They took it back under the reversion. However, the reversion clause said that we can still, uh, you know, we don't have to pull it out of the catalogs that have been distributed already. And if it gets used, we get paid. So it's not a perfect world, um, but all of these things are the reality of the industry. But to that lady, if you're watching this show, um, the lady that said, oh my gosh, you know, I, I would never give up 100% of my publishing. That's typical if you're a songwriter pitching songs to artists on labels. Typically, you would do a co-publishing deal, which means the publisher gets half of the publisher's share, the writer gets half of the publisher's share, and the writer keeps 100% of the writer's share. So basically, the writer's got a 75% interest in the song, and the publisher's got a 25% interest in the song. It's, it used to be extremely common, and it's still common just on a much smaller dollar level, that um, publishers who, let's say somebody like Sony ATV or Warner Chapel, they would sign writers to a... A deal where they would give them an advance. Um, I mean, it wasn't uncommon 15 years ago that you would get maybe 50 or 100 grand a year and you would turn in 12 songs a year that had to meet their quality bar that they felt were pitchable and workable on their end. Um, and that would be an advance against future royalties. So they would get 25% of the whole thing. In other words, it would be a co-pub deal where they would get half of the publisher's share in exchange for advancing you that money. Hang on. It's time for a sip of vitamin water. Remember Bear's baby aspirins when you were a kid? The chewable little orange aspirins? Vitamin water in the orange flavor tastes like those aspirins. Something kind of good about it. Um, uh, Peter Rahill says, that was a question posted on the 
forum just today. Good topic answer for that. Uh, are you talking about the thing that I just talked about, Peter? <laughs> Bear aspirin for children. Um, all right. So now we've talked about my gopher war. Uh, we've talked about an easier, faster, better way to get more music out there and make more money, especially in the, um, the world of, uh, um, uh, what do you call them? Inter instrumental cues. There's a phrase I say like 500 times a day. Um, Cass says, yep, Anna. Oh, Anna Yarbrough is asking about it in the forum. So did I answer it well? The, um, did that all make sense what I said? I got a lot of yeses. Good. <laughs> Martin, is your last name gravel like the stuff in a driveway or is it gravel? Just curious. Oh, Peter's yelling at me. <laughs> Thanks, Peter. <clears throat> All right. Cass is giving me a plus one. Uh, Peter's going to send her a link to this show. Thank you. Um, uh, Akira, hey, Akira, how you doing? Uh, Akira said, did I... No, somebody's trying to FaceTime me. Anyway, uh... Where'd we go? Uh, oh, did I answer Peter Rahill's question about two of the same song with two different vocalists? No, and I don't really understand the question, so lay it out for me and I'll be happy to give it my best shot. Wow, Victoria's got a, a dog bred for digging. I've got a dog you could borrow. He loves to dig up moles. Does he execute them when he digs them up or does he play with them like a, a cat would with a mouse? <laughs> All right, Anthony Fran says, great explanation. Awesome. All right. Uh, John Pearson's got a question, which is... John Pearson says, sorry? That's not a question, John. <laughs> Cass McKenty wants to know if my family's doing well. Um, they're... They're in Israel right now. They got, uh, well, two of the kids live there, and my wife and I were there visiting. She stayed on. She got stuck there. No, I think they're all enjoying the vacation from me. <laughs> um, Lisa Ar Arias says, what's the difference between licensing and exclusive? Um, those are two different things. Uh, you mean non-exclusive licensing and exclusive? Um, licensing is the overall thing. Basically, you are renting your work, permitting other people to rent your creation, your music. That's licensing. Um, exclusive means that somebody has the exclusive right to represent you. Non-exclusive means several people can represent the same piece of music. Go back and watch the earlier part of the show. I think we covered all that. I don't know who this phone number is that's waiting for me. That's so weird. Um, okay, John Pearson's question is, if I have a song signed to an exclusive library and they give me permission um, to submit to a direct-to-supervisor listing, is that cool? Yeah, um, I think you could probably expect that if you get a deal direct-to-supervisor, let's say it's a $2,000 sync fee, um, I think under the terms of the contract, although I'm not looking at it, but I think most contracts uh, would allow the publisher to come to you and say, hey, thanks for doing my work for me. I get half the money on that because we've got a 50-50 deal under an exclusive. They may be really gracious and let you out of that. I would get that in writing. Um, just to, even an email that says, yeah, we're fine with you pitching it. And if you make you know 2000 bucks on it, you keep the whole thing. Oh, if they would do the negotiations, if so if you pitch it, but they do the negotiation, they would clearly get whatever money's coming to them under the terms of the agreement because they would be participating.
Yeah, John Pearson, man. Uh, you've been on fire lately. I'm really, really proud of you. I remember it was like, I don't know, a couple of years ago, you were getting a little frustrated. Uh, I can't remember if it was because you went through a period of no forwards or you're getting forwarded and not getting any deals, but glad to see that that's all turned around. Wow, I can't believe it's 435 already. Um, Greg Carreza wants to... Oh, no, Greg's making a suggestion. I think you should give them two different names just so they're distinguished uh, by you, like uh, Jingle Bells JT and Jingle Bells BJ. Um, fair answer. Martin Gravel says it can be linked to the stuff in the driveway. Uh, my ancestor came from France in 1844 with the name and I can't do anything about that. It's not a terrible name. So Martin wants to know what the score is in the Gopher War. Yes, it's Michael won um, Gopher Zero. Um, the first day I got uh, the Gopher Hawk, it worked. <laughs> but man, I've put that thing in the ground so many times. It's so funny. Uh, I was showing the staff this morning. They're keenly aware of my Gopher Wars. Um, and this morning, um, there was a Gopher Hole and uh so or no it was last night there was a gopher hole and there was a little pile of dirt about this big which is kind of standard size so i i made a hole in the ground i put the gopher hawk in there i set it and went to sleep i woke up this morning and there was a new mound of dirt six inches from where i put that trap there must have been i don't know like eight soup bowls full of dirt piled up. So that gopher is just laughing at me. I mean, they are smart. They're, they're basically rats with different faces. They are cute. Martin Gravel says, no mercy. I know, you know, I mean, several members of my staff are animal lovers, as am I. You know what? I am not a rodent lover. Um, when we bought this house 18 years ago, um, the attic, I don't know how the inspector missed this, but the attic was completely filled with rat and squirrel poop to the point where you couldn't even see the pink color of the uh, insulation. So we had to spend $5,000 getting the entire attic stripped of all the insulation. Then they vacuumed it out. First they shoveled it, then they vacuumed it, then they vacuumed it again with a vacuum, or vacuums, plural. It's like three guys up there for a week uh, with HEPA filters. And then they sprayed it with disinfectant twice then we put down new insulation and then we sealed all the holes where the, the rats and squirrels were getting in there. So yeah, I'm not a fan of rats. Nobody's a fan of a rat unless they've got a pet rat. Um, not a fan of squirrels, even though they're cute, but they're destructive little buggers. I mean, we have cushions on the chairs in the backyard, you know, lawn furniture and squirrels will, will come out in the morning and there will be like the corner of a cushion totally eaten and the foam shredded and the fabric torn. Uh, Akira Canyon wants to know, are you the new Bill Murray from Caddyshack? Absolutely. I am totally at war. I'm consumed with these gophers. I, I find myself standing in the bedroom window in the morning when I wake up, looking outside, waiting to see gopher heads pop out. <laughs> Peter Rahill says, remember when the swampy cues were hot? Yeah, you know, like the dirty, dusty road... Um, kind of roadhouse sounding bluesy rock. They're, they're still somewhat in fashion, but not like they were about four years ago. Says you could uh, name one Gopher Broke. Gopher Broke. Cute, Peter. Uh, Darren Moss. How are you, Darren? Uh, would a record company get involved with an artist that was doing big numbers, um, sales, plays, and streams if the artist was older? Some labels would. I, I don't know that any of the majors would, although, you know what, look, uh, oh, I can't think of her name, uh, the large African-American woman who's like king of the world right now. Why can't I think of her name? Um, anyway, uh, body image, I mean, let's face it, Ed Sheeran, he's cute. He's kind of cuddly like a teddy bear, but he ain't handsome. Uh, he's no John Mayer. Um, he's incredible. I love, I, he's probably my favorite artist of the last five to 10 years, but, um, they are less concerned about that stuff. One of the reasons that major labels in particular 
um, have been concerned about age. First of all, uh, their demographic that consumes their music is generally younger, uh, oftentimes, you know, teens and 20 somethings. Um, so, you know, th there aren't a lot of teens that are going to run out and buy a record by me. But you know what? Uh, you could put a big marshmallow over your head and they would never know how old you are, depending on the kind of music. Um, or a big mouse thing, you know? Um, I've often fantasized about that. If I were to start actually making music, um, I would have to hide the fact that I'm old <laughs> and put a big marshmallow on my head. Um, Lizzo, thank you. I was going to say Lucy, but... At least I had the L right. Uh, John Pearson says, I started a company in 2001 doing humane animal removal from homes. Did so well, I sold it in 2015 and joined Taxi. Much prefer chasing deals than squirrels. Uh, John, you may have to come over and help me. You know, I'm, I'm all about humane. Uh, and I would relook. It's hard to catch a gopher. Uh, I mean, alive. <laughs> Let's just say, um, is dynamite allowed where your house is zoned? Uh, no, it's not. Uh, <laughs> have I had fantasies about pouring lighter fluid down the hole and dropping a match in? Yes, um, but I haven't done it. You know, we've had a coyote like three times in the last 10 or 11 days that has jumped the five or six foot wall that goes around the entire yard. California homes are usually separated by like these concrete brick walls. And uh, we live in an area, I mean, as I'm talking to you, I'm looking through the crack in our drapes. I, I'm looking three quarters of a mile away is a mountain range that's several thousand feet high, a couple thousand feet high. Um, we're in their neighborhood. Coyotes have always roamed here. Rabbits are, as a matter of fact, I live in what's called the Caneo Valley, which means Rabbit Valley. Uh, lots of food for the coyotes. And uh, coyotes are coming into my yard at night, uh, catching them on the security camera. And why are they coming? Because they're eating the gophers. Um, is it legal to, the coyotes are considered a pest under California law. Um, certainly under LA County law, they're considered a pest. And technically you can execute a coyote. My wife's like, don't you dare. Um, but you can't shoot them because you can't shoot a firearm in LA County. So I thought about getting a crossbow. <laughs> uh, I mean, these coyotes are really bold. My next door neighbors and I were talking over the five foot wall the other day and they were telling me that the same coyote I'm sure that's coming into our yard is in their yard. And uh, one morning, not that long ago, like a week or so ago, they woke up and they have French doors in their bedroom on the first floor of the house. And the coyote had its nose up against the glass of their bedroom door. So they're getting pretty bold. This one's bold. Uh, Clay Bearden says, coyotes are protected where I live. Yeah, they're protected now. Talk to me in five years. Uh, John Pearson says, I used to trap coyotes uh, difficult, but Nashville is overrun with them. Yeah, I mean, you know, I live very close to a major thoroughfare, and uh, there was a three-legged coyote in our town that was legendary. Come home from like a late dinner. I used to see it when I was working on road rally stuff. And I'd get home like 11, midnight, you know, and I'm driving on this main road and there's the three-legged coyote just walking in the bike lane like, no big deal. Wow, Clay lives along the American River. Nice. Can I come over and go fishing? Uh, Darren Moss, this is so cool you're doing this, Michael. You know, I'm not bored. I've been really busy, like super busy, working like 12 to 16 hours a day, pretty much seven days a week just because my computer's sitting here. I My computer's normally under the bed in my bedroom, and I work a lot in the morning when I get up. I work when I go to bed at night. I work on weekends. It's sad. Now, because the office is here in our kitchen, um, I'm just work. If I'm awake, I am working, and uh, I, I have no social contact. You know, uh, so I thought, wow, you guys must be going through that too. I mean, obviously, many of you have families. Um, but I just thought this is a cool way for us to spend afternoons together, um, talking about music stuff. 
started out as a place for everybody to drink because so many people tend to drink during regular taxi TV. But it's funny, nobody's drinking. Um, where's Jesse been? Uh, Jesse J. Peck, haven't seen him in any of these things. Um, Dean Turner asks, this is a great question. Is there a difference between a music library and a music licensing company? Technically, not really, but I believe there's a difference and it's semantics, but um, a music library can be what I would call kind of a trailer park operation. Some, not all, but some, if not many of the royalty free things are just, we'll take anybody's music, put it up online, organize it, make it downloadable, buyable, uh, licensable. And, and they've got a lot of schlock, not all of them. I don't want you to get the wrong impression that they're all this way, but some or many of them are. Um, it's a music library. Um, some of the music libraries that we work with at Taxi have been around a long time. They do great business. They're super ethical, hardworking people that really treat their composers and their artists well. And that's a music licensing company. It's, um, it's the difference between, I'm trying to think of a car brand, uh, between the difference between a Yugo, remember Yugos in the 80s? <laughs> difference between a Yugo and a Porsche, okay? They both have four wheels, they both have an engine, they both most of the time get you from point A to point B, but one of them is just a lot nicer. So. Yeah, music licensing company, in my personal opinion, that's what I prefer to call the companies. They shouldn't be called libraries. Um, yeah, now we're talking about booze. The uh, folks in the chat room are talking about Guinness. Um, Lisa Arias, what's in November is the Taxi Road Rally, the best convention for people like the people you're meeting here in our chat room. Um, they come from all over the world, uh, somewhere between 2,000 and 2,500 in any given year. We typically have about 16, 17, 18 different really good panels in the Grand Ballroom, which holds about 1,000 people. Upstairs above the ballroom, are typically um, several, if not many classes going on at the same time. Um, typically we will have 75 to 90 different classes during the course of the weekend, one-to-one -one mentoring where for free, and by the way, all this is for free, You can, if you're a taxi member or the guest of a taxi member. Uh, taxi members at the convention can sit down with a mentor. Could be the owner of a production music library, it could be a music attorney, uh, could be somebody, a taxi member who's more advanced and further down the road than they are, uh, which I think is the coolest thing at the Road Rally. The fact that our members who've become successful give it back, man, and, and they show up and, and they sit down and, and spend hours sharing what made them successful with other people who really could become their competition. But they realize that, you know, it's a big enough pool out there, there are enough opportunities that helping others be successful isn't gonna hurt them and kind of a karma thing actually helps them. Um, it, you've gotta experience it to believe it, but it's a thing and we've done 23 of them. We're coming up on number 24, uh, November this year, I think it's November 5th through the 8th. And I believe, that, you know, as of right now, we think that it looks pretty good that the road rally will take place. Um, Now, there weren't, uh, Peter Rahill says, weren't there about 3,000 people at the Road Rally last year? Um, I, I never give out exact numbers, but I can tell you that it was between, in our database, between 2,000 and 2,500. Um, I will also tell you that people have been known to sneak in or former members just show up. Um, we once did... A, an estimation and we think that about 600 people per road rally show up now we see people without badges on they show up on the second or third day they don't bother to go get their badge uh, we don't police badges at the ballroom door so they figure what the hell I'll just you know show up and I'm gonna bring two of my band members with me so who knows um, 2500 seems like a real number so there you go um, 
Italy. I saw somebody asking about Italy. Uh, Dean Turner says there were 3,000 people at the bar. Now, that is an accurate number. Um, yes, we had people from Italy uh, there. Yes, there are Italian taxi members. Um, I don't know how many without searching the database, but we've actually probably 15% of our membership. If you leave um, Canada... Yeah, leave Canada, because Canada is North America. So uh, if you consider like Australia and the UK, those are English-speaking um, international countries. Uh, but we've got people from Ibiza. Um, um, just everywhere you can imagine. Literally every country that you can imagine, some you couldn't even think of, are, are represented at the Road Rally. It's an awesome international community and... and Everybody is just so incredibly warm and welcoming and helpful to each other. None of this like, you know, I'm really cool. My music is awesome. Check out my leather pants and you probably suck. Uh, none of that. Um, Pierre, you're from Hong Kong. Um, are things uh, we keep hearing on, on the news in the U.S. that things are getting better there? Are they turning around as far as the virus goes? Pierre says Hong Kong is fine. I mean, fine. Only nine people dead altogether in Hong Kong? How is that even possible? But I'm happy to hear that. Um, Anthony, if you're saying that the reason that the atmosphere is so great at the Road Rally is probably a reflection of your leadership, if you're talking to me. Um, yeah, when I'm alone and stroking my own ego, I might believe that. But truly, look, I, I just, I always say, I built the foundation, um, built the barn, then opened the doors. It, it's really the people. Um, it's the screeners. Uh, you know, it's so funny. People want to believe that the screeners are like trying to keep them out of the industry and they're so hard on them. Um, and somebody didn't have enough coffee or didn't have a romantic interlude with one spouse that morning. They came in in a bad mood. Couldn't be further from the truth. Uh, the screeners are like you guys. They're musicians. They, they really derive a great deal of pleasure out of helping taxi members succeed. They love it when we forward emails from you guys um, about your successes to them, especially when it's about a particular listing and I got forwarded and I got a deal and now it resulted in a placement. That makes them feel really, really good. So they bring a lot of that to the road rally with them. Um, Project D9 says, I've been to two road rallies coming from Italy. Amazing experience. Yeah, there is no greater compliment um, to me to taxi to the road rally than when I bump into people from, you know, that flew 10, 15, 20 hours. It's not uncommon that I run into several people during the course of a road rally. It stopped me in an elevator and say, I want you to know I traveled for 24 hours hours from point to point to come to this thing i just arrived yesterday how they're standing i do not know and and just even going through the registration line last night was so incredibly wonderful that it was worth the trip that is the highest compliment that, that i ever get um john pearson says he really appreciates screener number 19 i will let him know that by the way there's a place on the forum at forums.taxi.com where you can do screener shout outs and um bria actually prints those out and, and puts them up in the uh in the kitchen the break room at the office so that they can read about it when they go in there to grab a cup of coffee um Clay Bearden says, companies generally take on the personality of the CEO. Well, then I feel really sorry for my staff, but thank you for saying that. <laughs> oh, man. 
Dan Weber says he found out that he's had 42 placements in Hong Kong, Singapore, and the UAE. Wow, that's cool. Oh, Bria just posted the link to the the forum uh, where you guys can do the shout outs to the screeners. Say hello to Bria. She's with us today in the chat room. Um, uh, Akira says, can we get a cocktail service while in the road, registra road rally registration line? Yeah, you know, um, I have tried so hard. Um, I'll run around with energy drinks, bringing rock stars, you know, cases of them into the people in the line. Um, and the hotel, uh, you would think that they would want to make money by doing that, you know? Uh, do you know that those roll around bars that we've got on the second floor during uh, like the open mic nights and stuff? Do you know that the hotel charges me, charges taxi to put those up there? We have to pay the two guys standing at the bar and we have to pay for like the bar rental and stuff. We don't make a penny on the food or liquor, not a penny. Um, I have a feeling that it will be easier to negotiate deals with the hotel moving forward. We're right now getting ready to sign the deal for 2021. Uh, George Gillen says, great show, Michael, as always. Thank you, George. Thanks for coming. Um, oh, Bree is getting a bunch of shout outs from the guys. Daryl Berman says, it's great. I can't wait to meet you guys at the Road Rally. You know, that's part of the reason that the Road Rally is so awesome is that people get to know each other here in this chat room on Taxi TV and for the quarantine hangouts or uh, happy hours. Um, they get to know each other on the forum. They help each other. And then when they meet in person, it's like a family reunion that you actually want to go to. <laughs> um Tony Salato says, looks like you're out of Rockstar for a while now. Hold on, Tony. Don't go away. I'll be right back. <clears throat> I went to the office earlier today to check and see if we had any mail. And before I walked, I thought, you know, I should grab some rock stars and bring them home. It's really weird. Um, Taxi is in an office complex of three buildings that are each approximately 20,000 square feet. Um, the first building had almost as many cars as it would have during a normal work week parked out in front of it. The middle building, our building, had three cars, um, guys who own other companies. I know the owners of the other companies because we all tend to work late and run into each other in the parking lot a lot. Um, they're there working in the office. Um, in the back building, they've got one of those companies that like does surveys and focus groups and that kind of stuff. Um, they must have had 75 cars out in front of their building. So... Apparently, not everybody is following the rules and not all businesses that are non-essential are actually closed down. Shame on them. Um, Bria's name is spelled, this is the Scottish spelling, uh, it's spelled like Briagha. There it is, Dan Weber's got it right. Briagha, B-R-I-A-G-H-A. Um, Daryl Berman asks, anybody using Zoom to collaborate? I, I'm sure that musicians are like crazy. Um, you can get 40 minutes at a crack with your free account. And we've been using Zoom um, for staff meetings, um, whether it's like part of the staff or the full staff. We've had a couple of staff meetings, uh, two, three, I don't know, where it's been the full staff, where they're like 10 of us, um, not the screeners, but the, the core businessy side of the staff. And uh, it, it works well, I gotta say. Hats off to them for creating great software. And they've been kind enough that when you hit your 40 minute limit, um, I think most of the time we've gotten a free extension. Worst case scenario, you can just fire it back up again and get another 40 minutes. Um, anything else? We got about a minute left before I sign off on today's show. Although I feel like I could hang out with you guys all night except 
I've got a steak defrosting on the counter and I'm going to cook it on the grill tonight because it's not raining. Yay. Be sure to use a secret password to prevent Zoom bombing. I don't know about Zoom bombing, but I think the CIA just picked up our conversation. <laughs> Uh, I love WhatsApp. The, actually, it was my wife had the idea about two years ago to put the whole staff on WhatsApp. Um, we use it to communicate with each other for the road rally. Um, if I'm out of town, the staff communicates uh, with myself and my wife on, on WhatsApp. Uh, and frankly, um, it, it's the single best idea my wife has ever had regarding taxi. It's brought our staff closer together. WhatsApp is cool. It's, it's a, mess a group messaging app that um, you can make video calls on it for free. You can make phone calls on it for free. You can text on it for free. Um, and, and Bria and Ariana and I, uh, the other day, uh, we're setting something up, I think, for the split screen uh, taxi TV we did last week. And I didn't even realize it, but you can just tap the video camera on the whole group and boom, you're up there like the Brady Bunch. It's free. I don't understand how it's free or why it's free, but it's free. And it works pretty good. I mean, that's one reason my family and I don't miss each other uh, so much with them being 7,500 miles away is we video chat on, on WhatsApp all the time. <laughs> Cass says his goats are failing their guitar lessons. Cass is my hero. He's got, what do you have, seven goats now? Seven or eight goats? I love goats. Goats are cool. All right. Our time is up. Our time for today's session is over. <laughs> oh, man. Eight goats. Man, goats are cool. They're, they're like, in some ways, even better than dogs. And I love dogs. I love big dogs. Um, yeah, you can bet your butt, Pearson, as <laughs> soon as this is over. By the way, John, you'll appreciate it. Check out Gopher Hawk. Uh, when you get off this chat, go check out the Gopher Hawk. Watch the videos on YouTube. Um, it's like 26 bucks, and the thing works, and it's so easy. You don't have to dig out the, the gopher run and carefully place the trap. Basically, you just prod around with a rod that comes with it. You find the run. And you take this thing called the wedge, which is basically like a pogo stick with a point on it. You put it in the ground and then you feel for, you know, where the run is on either side of that hole. And you stick the other thing in there, which is basically a spring loaded trap. You don't have to bait it or anything. And as soon as those little bugger goes, you know, from point A to point B, ba-boom, one less gopher. Um, goats are better than gophers. Um, all right, guys, I will see you tomorrow. Thank you for hanging out. I enjoyed today's quarantine happy hour a great deal. I hope you did as well. We will see you tomorrow for another one. If you guys would be so kind, after this is up, uh, the archive is up on YouTube, go post some topic starters for tomorrow's show, will you? I'd really appreciate that. Um, give us a like. Uh, if you're not a subscriber, please subscribe. Tell your friends. Let's get some strangers in here so that they can feel the love, all right? All right. See you guys tomorrow, 4 o'clock, same time, same channel. Bye.